If you want to play creatively and improvise on the drums, you have to feel free, relaxed, and musical. Now where do these things start? With syncopation. The problem though is that a lack of coordination often stands in the way of syncopation. It is a frustrating, self-doubt inducing barrier that can sometimes stop you in your tracks. But not to worry because today I'm sharing a solution. Here are three steps you can take to build more independence for creative syncopated drumming. You can do this. Hey, welcome to the Non-Glamorous Drummer. I'm so glad you're hanging out with me today. I help hobby and semi-pro drummers become the players that other people actually want to play with and want to listen to. And I do this by teaching you the core fundamental skills that help you save time in the practice room. These things help you grow faster. And hey, speaking of that, how would you like to know the fastest way possible to master the drums? Well, I have a free e-guide for you that's gonna help you with just that because the biggest thing that stands in our way of quick growth is not knowing what to practice. It's that simple. But when you know what to practice and you know what to work on, you know what those specifics are and you know how to build a balanced practice session that delivers results day after day and week after week, that is the secret to success. This guide is called Know What to Practice, the three-part daily practice routine for busy drummers. If you've just got 30 minutes a day or a few hours on the weekend, this is your one-stop shop here for knowing what to work on so that whenever you do sit down to practice, you've got specific goals in mind. That's how you grow. So go grab this. It's in the description. Total no-brainer. My free gift to you. All right, on with today's lesson. If you've always wanted to be able to improvise funky syncopated grooves, this lesson today is definitely for you because you can learn to do this even if you're a total beginner, even if you feel like you don't have a lot of kick snare freedom, you'll be able to get there because I'm going to walk you through these three steps. We're going to be talking about the simple power of singles between hand and foot. And then we're gonna talk about implementing space in your playing, that's really important. And also we're gonna talk about how we can use stick control, how we can use patterns from George Lawrence Stone's old classic method book, Stick Control, to actually push our coordination even more and get to where we can play these funky types of patterns. And then I'm gonna share with you a really cool bonus that'll really push your coordination and give you the ability to actually play a lot of the funk timekeeping patterns and left foot timekeeping patterns you've heard on some favorite songs. So this is a lesson that is very simple and we're doing a lot of very simple things. And so wherever you're at, even if you're a total beginner, there's a lot here for you. We're also gonna get pretty advanced. And so if you're a more intermediate to advanced player, there's definitely something here for you too. And all of the notation from, from these exercises is in a PDF notation guide you can grab for free in the description. So you can grab that, that way you can take all this to your practice room. So let's dig into step number one, which is use the simple power of singles between hand and foot. In other words, what we wanna do is get comfortable playing the kick or playing the snare on an E or an U uh of the beat. Now, even if you don't know how to count, this is simple, it makes sense. If we're playing 16th notes, we count those as one E and a two E and a three E and a four E and a one E and a two. And so that means if we're playing singles here on the snare, then our left hand is always gonna be what lands on an E or an U, uh, an off beat. One E and a uh, two E and a uh. so right hand is just playing you know steadily pretty much on the beat, but left hand is filling those spaces and going to uh, 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 playing what kind of feels syncopated. If we start throwing in left hand accents when we're playing singles, boom boom to ba da boom uh uh boom boom ka, that feels syncopated. That's what we think of what we call syncopation really, where it's an accent happening where you don't really expect it, where there wouldn't normally be one. That's really the definition of syncopation, and so. That, being able to play a, a snare note or a kick note in the midst of a groove on an E or an uh, on E and uh, two, E and uh, three, E and uh, four, that's what creates a syncopation. And the building blocks for getting that are actually very simple. First, real quick, I'll play you, like, here's, here's a simple groove, just to illustrate what I'm talking about. So much of that felt really syncopated because there wasn't a backbeat every time. It wasn't boom, got, got. There wasn't that reliable backbeat. So it kind of makes you feel a little bit uneasy, a little bit of tension there and lots of And that is not that difficult to play when you're comfortable playing kick and snare on the off beats. So simple exercises to do that. I love how simple this is. If you can play singles, you can play singles on your snare. Move that right hand to the ride. 
What are we doing? We're keeping eighth note time with the right hand on the ride, or we could do it on the hats or anywhere else. And we're playing the off beats, those E's and U's, those syncopated parts of the beat with the left hand on the snare. Then we could just take this and apply it to the foot and we could sit here and play right hand and right foot back and forth. So basically singles with the right side of your body. Now that might feel weird the first time you do it and if anything isn't even, you gotta practice that really slow and focus on So definitely make sure that's smooth and solid. You don't wanna hear that galloping effect of like. You know, if that's happening, you know, okay, I gotta back off, I gotta slow down and be patient here. But if your singles are nice and smooth, so you've got the hand-to-hand -hand smoothness going on, which you'll get with just a little bit of practice if you're a total beginner, then apply that same kind of smooth feel. And it's both, you know, it's both limbs here are the right side of your body. So in a way that can make it easier than going right hand, left foot, which would be another challenging way to, to do this type of exercise. But practice this slowly. until it's feeling comfortable and it's feeling consistent and smooth. You could even go as slow as eighth notes at 80 beats a minute. So 80 might be about right here, quarter notes. So you could do eighth notes at 80. One and two and three and, or slow it down to even 70, 60. No specific number here, go as slow as you need to so you can get those eighth notes back and forth. And then as you get faster, you can start thinking in terms of sixteenths, like a one E and a two E and. And eventually you'll be able to do it in your sleep. It just takes that repetition of getting comfortable with it because we're building coordination here. We're making sure that not just are our, our, our hands coordinated, but also our right hand and our right foot are coordinated with each other. That's very important here. Then you can mix these patterns together. So literally we could do something like this. That has a super, super weird syncopated feel because nothing is ever lining up on the eighth note, but we could throw in a few notes that do line up and then we kind of have this funky syncopated feel. Because literally all we're doing is throwing in some snare and kick notes that alternate with our right hand and then throwing in some that line up. And that way it has this funky, cool, mixed up feeling. And when you start taking that a little faster, and better yet, throw in some ghost notes. That's a topic for another video, doing ghost notes well, but I'll link that lesson in the description. When you start changing up the dynamics, it gets even more funky. Throw in some hi-hat splashes and change up the timekeeping. That's what we're gonna do a little later. I told you about the bonus where we switch up right hand timekeeping. So we're going there. Lots of very cool stuff you can do with this, but what I wanna make sure that you get right here, right off the bat, especially if you're a beginner, is that you can create these syncopated funky grooves very simply when you know the building blocks. And that's why our step one is so simple. We're just talking singles. Singles between hands, singles between right hand and right foot. Step number two, this one's really interesting. Implement the power of space in your playing. A lot of times things don't feel syncopated and maybe feel kind of boring uh, and just not that interesting if there's too many notes. Like if I sit here and I play. Maybe there's a song that requires something like that, like a really heavy rock song maybe, but that's just a lot of notes and they're all the same dynamic, just hammering into your ear. I could switch up the dynamics a little and definitely make that a lot more interesting, but a really simple, quick way to just make something more syncopated is not to add more notes, but to take away notes. So think about this. If we, if we had just a, a measure of 16th notes around the kit, so. So just think in terms of a 16th fill around the kit, maybe you've got a third tom, I've just got two, so you could do four notes on each drum, basic fill. Now, there's nothing really syncopated about that. We're just playing a fill around the kit. However you choose to orchestrate it. But what if we start removing notes? What if we take out the note we were playing on beat three? So we play one E and a, two E and a, three E and a, four E and a. So we take out beat three, that note on beat three, 
that means that it leaves a little gap, which kind of makes our ear emphasize that uh of two right before it, which feels syncopated. So it ends up turning into this. One E and a two E and a three E and a four E and. So just taking out that one note suddenly changes it up. Because it puts like a, it creates two phrases here. Suddenly we've broken the fill into two parts, where it's not just a ba da 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 da, which might be right for the song, but can also be kind of boring. Now it's turned it into a two phrase fill, a two part fill. Ba 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 ba. Doom 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 boom. So think about how you can take one note out or two notes, or you could get crazy and do three or four. You just have to remember what am I taking out and keep track of it but try taking out just one note, especially a note that's on a beat, so that suddenly you've got an emphasis on an uh, one e and uh, e and uh, boo, 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 do, do, do. It makes it so much more interesting. A way you can try this, here's an exercise I recommend you do, if you're new to this especially. If you've got a whiteboard handy, like just a dry erase marker, whiteboard, or maybe you've got like a note taking app on your iPad, um, I have good notes on mine, I use it all the time, then what I want you to do is write either like write 16 16th notes. So just write 16 notes across. Uh, if you don't want to like write the notes, that's fine. Just write R, L, R, L. So right, left, right, left, 16 times. So R, L, R, L, R, L, R, L. You can do it in groupings of four so you can see it clearly. Then just erase one. So either erase it off your whiteboard that you got sitting over here by your drums or erase it there on your iPad. So now you can see, all right, that's the note I took out. You're making sure that you're keeping that sticking the same. You're just leaving out a note, just skipping right over it. Then take out another note, because now you've got it visually right there. So you can see what you're doing and what you've taken out and what you've left. So now take out another note or take out two or three notes, take out a whole beat. So that now suddenly you might have Suddenly it gets really interesting if you leave like beat two silent. So it's really cool what you can do with this because creating unique fills doesn't necessarily start with adding more notes. It's not so much the notes you play, it's when you play them. And so when you take out notes, suddenly it puts more emphasis on the notes that are left. And sometimes the fewer notes you play, the more interesting the fill is. That's why a lot of times really interesting fills are fills that are like, um, I'll count this off so you can feel it right, but like one, two, three, four, Like that, where it's like a big open, ba, boom, doom, ka, pss, boom, da, where it just feels weird and it's like, wow, what was that? It's so interesting because of where those notes are placed, and there's not many of them. And so it's like you hear one note and you're wanting to know when's the next one? Okay, there's an, okay, when's the next? Oh, that was weird, that was cool. It's a great way to create cool fills. And so this is a really fun strategy and a fun exercise for doing that. So get out your whiteboard and dry erase markers or note taking app on your iPad, even easier, because then you can undo and play around with all sorts of different combinations and permutations of, uh, of different 16th fills. Now I'll also add, you do have to have a good internal clock to do this. I, what I mean by that is you've gotta have a good internal sense of time. So if I, like the fill that I just played, ba, boom, doom, doom, whatever that was, I already forgot it. If you're gonna play a fill with a lot of space, you've gotta feel that pulse. You've gotta feel the quarter note or the eighth note pulse. Otherwise, you end up in the middle of it and you're like, wait, when does this fill end? And so it can get kind of tricky. So you want to make sure you're always feeling that. And you can practice that by actually keeping time with your left foot. That's a fun coordination challenge. I'm doing that now as I demonstrate to you. But it would mean you're kind of hearing this quarter note as you play. And so if you're feeling that, then it doesn't matter what you play. You can always play it in time and always get out of it in time. Great exercise for doing that. It's what I call the metronome weaning exercise. Nothing new, you've seen other drummers, teachers do this and teach this, but practice playing with a more sparse metronome. So like setting your metronome to quarter notes and then setting it to only play half notes all the while you're trying to keep time with it. So there's less and less metronome to play along with. And so if I did this here on my phone in Tempo Advance, my favorite metronome app, so right now it's playing, we'll go a little faster here. Right now it's playing quarter notes at 100. So maybe first we start grooving along the quarters at 100, then we chop out beats two and four. We've just got one, three, one, then we chop out beat three, now we just got one. And we're still grooving along and we're trying to make sure that we still hit that downbeat every time. You could also get even crazier. 
and set it to where now you're only hearing a click every other measure. Three, four, silence, two, three, four, one, two, three. It gets weird, it gets funky. Another great app for, uh, for doing this is an app called Gap Click by Benny Greb. Really cool app because you can set you can set it to keep click for like a measure and then no click for a measure or a click for four bars, no click for four bars. You can do these different combinations. That way you can sit there and you can be grooving along with the metronome. And suddenly the click is just out from under you, but then it comes back in and you find out whether or not you're with it. That is an excellent way to increase your time because it helps you listen more to yourself, be more aware of what you're playing, and just develop that internal sense of time that helps so much with playing accurate, tight, precise syncopation like you hear your favorite drummers do. And now step number three, use stick control to greatly push your syncopation. So that is this book right here. If you don't have it, I think every drummer ought to have stick control. If you don't have it, go find it on Amazon. It's pretty cheap from what I remember. It's just one of those classic methods you can grab anywhere. And it's so practical, so useful. Just the first three pages of it are great because it has all these different sticking combinations written out as eighth notes. And so there's singles, doubles, paradiddles, all these different stickings. What we can do with this is apply to the kit. We can take the right hand and play it on the kick drum or take the left hand and play it on the snare. So just to get started with this, if you don't have stick control, that's fine. Start with a regular paradiddle. So like paradiddle sixteenths between the kick and the snare. So normally our paradiddle would be like this. Right, left, right, right, left, right, left, left, so on. But we can take the right hand part and play that on the kick. Then keep time with the right hand. We'll do eighth note time on the ride. The other way we could do this is then have right hand follow the right foot and we could play it this way. A great exercise in locking your right hand with your right foot. That's something we talked about on a video here on the channel not long ago, I'll link it below, about getting right hand and right foot or left hand and right foot locked in, locking in different limb combinations, very good stuff. So that's a great way to practice that. Then you could also say, as we're, as we're doing paradiddles, so we've got paradiddles going on, eighth note timekeeping. As we start getting faster, we could think about, hey, what if we apply step two, the power of space? What if we apply that to here and we decide, let's just start taking stuff out. So maybe we've got, um, we could take out beat two. Maybe we just hit the snare on beat two and then nothing else. We could even cut out the timekeeping there. That'd be pretty interesting to play. Or maybe we cut out some extra notes there at the end and we play. Um, and so suddenly it gets really interesting. You kind of get into like, kind of makes me think of mute math, Darren King's drumming where he might be grooving along and he's like, Darren King would totally play that kind of stuff where it's just the, what makes it so interesting isn't so much the notes and the things he's playing, it's where does he not play? Where does he suddenly drop a beat and just leave stuff out, leave stuff out and like miss a downbeat and play? And so sometimes that's all you gotta do to shake something up and make it really funky, really interesting. So practice making those up on the spot. Maybe in, in, on your iPad, on your whiteboard, practice actually figuring it out and pre-planning pre it and knowing what you're gonna do, but then see if you can get to where you can start improvising that. Just to pull a stick control example, so one of my favorite stick control exercises is here on the first page, so if you've got it, pull it up. If you don't, that's fine. You can practice all this kind of stuff even without it, but I definitely recommend you get it. The last exercise on page five, which is really the first page, so exercise number 24. Right, right, left, left, right, left, right, right, left, left, right, right, left, right, left, left. I've always thought that was a really fun one.
where you're kind of combining a double, like the right, right, left, left, with a paradiddle, right, left, right, right. And it's really, it's easy to play fast when you've got that technique down. And so this is a really fun one too. So let's say we wanted to do this instead of a paradiddle. Or you can get really crazy, like with 23, where you've got... Where it sounds totally weird, but honestly, because I think it's not super musical, it ends up functioning as a great strength builder. So building up some foot power down there and some wrist up here, and just ability to hammer stuff out. And so practicing any of these patterns like this is so cool. Such a great way to build your way toward improvisation because if you wanna be able to improvise these, you've gotta learn a lot of them. Like figure out how to play a lot of weird patterns and then what'll happen is that'll start to flow out of your, your natural creativity. When you'll be sitting there coming up with something, these things that are stored now in the back of your head, they'll start coming out. And so you build up that ability to draw from and then kind of make it your own and make up stuff. And that's what's really cool. So definitely spend some time on patterns like this. Make up your own patterns. Do paradiddles, doubles back and forth, singles back and forth, all these kinds of things and get creative with it. All right, so on to our bonus step. I told you earlier we'd get through these first three steps and then talk about how can we take all this to the next level by switching up our right hand timekeeping and adding in some left foot timekeeping. That's where this gets really cool. So this is where, this might be the step for you. Like maybe you've already been working these patterns between hand and foot. You feel like you've got a lot of good kick snare freedom. You're feeling pretty good about the syncopation. You know how to add some space in your playing. Maybe this, maybe this part's for you, where you need to be able to improvise on the kick and snare while holding down a certain pattern on the ride or while keeping the hands going with the hi-hat. That's where you're ready to layer in this stuff. So first thing we can do, we're just gonna put this in the context of paradiddles. For the sake of demonstration, you could be doing any patterns out of stick control or any other pattern you make up. But first thing we might wanna do is just play quarter notes with the right hand. Sometimes what's really difficult to do is play a slower, timekeeping pattern with your right hand than what you're playing on the kick and snare. For instance, it's easier to play For most people, it's easier to play more notes there with the timekeeping than with the kick and snare. What's weird is to go It's just kind of weird because your right hand is like, when's the next note? I want to play again. And you start to want to rush. It's hard to keep that space there. Notice how I took a breath before I started that. It was almost like, here we go. That's actually a good thing to do. When you start something like this, think, just relax yourself. Like get relaxed before you play it because you've got to make sure that right hand is relaxing. And decide what you're gonna do with your stick in between those two. Like, are you gonna go like that or kind of do what I did and glance off down to here? I like the glancing because it feels very natural. I don't really have to think about it. And I, I see a lot of drummers do that too, where if they're playing something slow here, that can work great. So can. Whatever you want to do. Only thing to not do is this. Where it's like you're hammering it out. Try to be loose, let the stick bounce. Anyway, so that's a great layer, right hand timekeeping layer to apply to this. So pra practice doing the paradiddles just with the quarter notes there. And what I'll do in a moment, once I break down all these for you, I'll then just play all these different combinations back to back just so you can hear them. So the next one might be right hand 16ths. So now we've got 16th notes locking in with the 16ths happening here. By the way, the challenge being to maintain a gunk, 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 sort of that molar two stroke, loud, soft, loud, soft, loud, soft pattern with the right hand. Instead of ga, 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 you could do it that way too. But if you can make it go boom, 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 boom while doing this, that's great. That's what I want you to really work toward. And so go as slow as you have to for that. If you need to go really slow and go,
so slow that you're thinking through each little note you're playing. That's fine, that's the way to do this. Go slow enough that your brain can digest it. You can actually master this and get it feeling smooth. That way then you can start going faster. By the way, ghosting the non-backbeats is another great bonus step. I just do that by default because it sounds so much better and more musical. And so that's why I referenced that ghosting lesson earlier. Definitely check that out if you need to work on your dynamic range and figuring out how to make the, the, the ghost note happen after the backbeat and the backbeat happen after the ghost note. It's so easy for our left-hand dynamics to get sloppy. So there's a lot you can focus on to really nail that down. So I'll put that lesson in the description. Now what's also really cool, you can take that right hand 16th timekeeping pattern and just play one E and two E and talk about pulling out notes to make something more interesting. Instead of just playing a whole string of 16th notes, we could go. Which is also easier to play faster and that's something that you hear in a lot of funk kind of music where you might hear something like. Like that, where it's just an interesting way to play it or the flip side, kind of the vice versa there would be one and a two and a three instead of a one e and two e and. So that'd be another way to do it. So going back to the paradiddles, if we go very slowly, we could do one e and and play. Or one and a. And so go really slow as you're first doing this. First time I ever practiced that, I had to go really slow to make sure that things were locking with it. It's easy to go really fast and try to go like. And things start flaming and it's like, well, there's some flaming, but it's not too sloppy, right? Because as you're going faster, it, it's almost like tempo can hide sloppiness in a way. The faster you go, the cleaner you start to convince yourself it actually is. But then you back the tempo off and you go slow and that exposes how bad it is because then you realize. And it can easily turn into a mess. I'm not trying to pick on you. I'm not trying to judge you here. I know that I've been there and it's easy to kind of get something together at a quicker tempo and then slow it down and realize, wait a second, do I actually have this down? No, I don't. So practice it very slowly. That way it's super solid, you got it down. And then as you go faster, it's gonna stay super clean. All right, the other combination. So left foot, we could either play on the ands or the eighth notes. And of course there are other things you could do too, but I think those are, those are my two favorites. And so if we're doing the, the eighth notes, really we just wanna get our left foot bouncing. Now that's a technique I call a leg bounce. I've got a specific lesson on that. I'll link below so you can check that out in more detail. But the leg bounce means we're playing heel up and we're bouncing our legs so that we can just automatically keep time, which makes it a lot easier. When you're going fast, that's definitely what you wanna do. And so it's kinda of like a hack in a way. You can also use that same technique if you just wanna play on the ands where you can do a little bit of a ghost bounce on the beat. So all the left foot technique, all the details of that are in another lesson. So you can check that out if you'd like to. But practice incorporating that. So maybe we're doing eighth notes on the ride or I was doing it on the rims just for a little less washy noise here. So we're doing paradiddles and then practice doing left foot on the eights or on the ands. So now I'll demonstrate all these back to back for you. With the metronome, we'll go 60 beats a minute, nice and slow, play these as 16th. So just so you can listen to it back to back and hear how some of these might play out.
So my question to you, what is your weak point in all of this? Do some self-analysis and think, all right, what am I good at here? What am I good on? Uh, but what's the weak area? Uh, out of all this stuff, do I, need to, do I need to work step one, that fundamental of singles between hands, singles between right hand and right foot, just to start placing kick snare notes on offbeats? Is that where I need to camp for a while? Or maybe I'm playing too many notes and I need to work on implementing space, and so maybe I need to build my internal clock in order to do that. That was me for sure. I got good at playing a whole bunch of notes, but not good at manipulating where those notes were placed. And so in order to become more musical, I had to get more precise and build my timing, that internal clock, and learn how to take things out and strip things away and play more simple fills that were more impactful, but that were maybe syncopated and felt really cool like the ones I showed you. And so maybe that's you. Maybe that's the step you need to take. Or maybe you're ready to dive into stick control and doing different patterns here and maybe even working the right hand patterns, the left foot patterns, just to really build tremendously more four-way coordination. Maybe that's where you're at. Maybe you're ready for that. But work through all three of these steps, plus the bonus step. And don't forget to download my guide, the three-part daily practice routine for busy drummers. That's gonna help you out so much because if you're tight on time and you've got work, you've got a family, you've got other hobbies and just other life obligations, and you can't spend all day playing drums like maybe you could when you were in high school, like I know I did. And so things are tight. You've got, you've got to narrow down your focus and say, all right, here's what I'm gonna work on today. Here's what I'm gonna work on tomorrow. Here are the goals for this week. And so this guide is really cool because it gives you all the concrete specifics. Like, hey, work on this hand exercise. Focus on this stuff with your grip. Hey, do these coordination exercises. And you can even choose and pick, like, do I wanna work on this kind of coordination thing or this kind of coordination thing? And then there's even some tips for musicality in there too. So this guide is your cheat sheet. It's gonna condense all the key things you need to know into one location, one spot. So if you're busy and you just got 30 minutes a day to practice or a couple hours every weekend, this is gonna help you still make progress, which is essential. You can master the drums, you can grow on the drums, even if it's just a little side hobby that you feel like you don't have a lot of time for, but you still wanna get good at it and you're passionate about it, this is gonna help you do that. I wanna see you grow on the drums and this is, your, this is definitely your solution. Thanks as always guys for watching today. Thanks for hanging out, this has been a lot of fun. Hope you got a lot out of this. Hope you have a great week. I'll see you on the next lesson. Stay non-glamorous. Always know that you can do this.